new product overview video for the new Legacy GP9s. These locomotives are available in the following road names. We have available two road numbers for, the, for powered units as well as a third road number for a non-powered unit. They are available in Baltimore and Ohio as we have here, Boston and Maine, Chicago and Northwestern, Erie, Nickel Plate Road, Southern Pacific, and Wabash. Out of the package you will receive the instruction manual for the locomotive, four replacement traction tires, the engine memory module which is specific to the road name and road number of the locomotive, smoke fluid funnel, and the smoke fluid pipette. These locomotives feature a die cast pilot, truck, side frames, and fuel tank. They have a stamped metal frame, a plastic shell, dual vertical can motors, a fan driven smoke unit, directional LED headlights, and operating coil couplers on the front and rear of the locomotive. They also feature legacy rail sounds, legacy speed control. For the GP9, all of the switches are located on the underside of the locomotive. But before we get that far, I'd like to show you a little trick when it comes to adding smoke fluid to your locomotive. As, as is a perfect example on this Baltimore and Ohio model, there are rain caps over top of the smokestacks, which would make adding smoke fluid very difficult. Because the smoke unit on these GP9s have a funnel that go from the smoke unit to both outlet holes on the top of the shell, it's possible that when you add smoke fluid, that fluid will collect in that funnel. With that fluid laying inside that funnel, it'll collect the vapors and the amount of exhaust that comes out of the engine will not be what it potentially can be. So to fix this, it's really simple. Whenever you add smoke fluid to your GP9, you can actually remove the hatch on the top of the shell. In this case, because we have a dynamic brake cover, we simply grab the cover and lift upwards. The hatch comes off completely and reveals the smoke unit funnel. When you add smoke fluid, just take the funnel off by pulling straight up, add your smoke fluid to the hole, reinstall your smoke funnel, and then reinstall the dynamic brake hatch and it simply snaps into place. This will keep the funnel clear of fluid and allow the locomotive to produce the maximum amount of exhaust. So to get to our switches, we're going to have to flip the locomotive over. This is the battery hatch. It's quite alright if it comes off. And we have the following switches. The first switch we have is the program run switch. Place the switch in the program position to assign the ID number of the locomotive using either TMCC or Legacy. Then place the switch back in the run position to operate the locomotive. The engine will keep that ID number until you change it again in the future. For conventional operators, placing the switch in the program position is your E-unit lockout switch that will keep the locomotive running in one direction all the time. In the run position, you'll be able to access all three directional states. The next switch we have is the Odyssey on-off switch. This is for the speed control. When the switch is in the ODY position, the Odyssey speed control is enabled and the locomotive will maintain a constant speed regardless of track conditions or load. In the no ODY position, the Odyssey speed control is disabled. When Odyssey is disabled, it is not uncommon for it to take several turns of the red wheel on either the cab one or the legacy remote to get the locomotive to begin moving. If you're operating with legacy, TMCC, or conventional, and you want optimal performance, we suggest leaving the switch in the ODY position. On the other side of the locomotive, we have the following switches. And that switch would be the smoke on off switch. In the SMK position, the smoke unit is enabled. So for conventional operators, the smoke unit will be on when the power is applied to the track. 
For legacy and TMCC users, when the switch is in the SMK position, you will be able to control the smoke unit from your legacy or your TMCC remote. In the no SMK position, the smoke unit is permanently disabled and will prevent the smoke from coming on in a conventional environment and will also prevent you from controlling it on and off with either a legacy or a TMCC remote. Now before we place our locomotive on the track, we want to make sure we perform some preventive maintenance. This is done by using a bottle of oil with a needle applicator. We want to place a small drop of oil on the axle where it goes through the bearing block on the truck. Do this on all sides of both trucks and to all the axles. This will prevent any unnecessary squealing or whining coming from the trucks. We strongly encourage you not to lubricate the external gears on either truck as this will provide an environment that allows the truck and those gears specifically to pick up debris around the layout and ultimately affect performance. It's also a good idea to apply a drop of oil to the axle for the collector roller. You want to do this to both collectors on both trucks and then just work that in with your finger. That'll prevent any type of un unwanted squealing or whining sound from coming from the trucks. Before we get our legacy GP9 on the track, we must first tell our remote what we're going to call it. Since the B&O GP9 has a road number of 6448, using our numbering convention of the last two digits of the road number, we'll call it engine 48. So on our legacy remote, we simply press engine 48. We then locate the orange memory module that came with the locomotive and insert it in the top of our legacy remote. To access the engine info screen, we press the info button in the upper right hand corner. Now we want to press the button underneath load. It tells us the module is inserted. It's a Baltimore and Ohio 38874 GP9 number 6448. It asks us if we'd like to load the engine data. Press the button under yes. It now tells us the engine data is loaded and we can remove the module. Take the module out. Take just a moment and show you what this did. It already assigned our road name and road number so we can skip this screen by pressing scroll. It has set our type to diesel. Press scroll again it set our control to legacy mode, press scroll again, and it set our sound to legacy rail sound. To exit this screen, we simply press the info key, and the road number appears at the top momentarily, and you can see Baltimore and Ohio GP9 scrolling across the top. I'd like to take a moment and show you what this has done for us on the touchpad. The memory module loaded the following icons on the touchpad. Volume up, crew talk, manual RPM control up, volume down, the black circle is engine shutdown sounds. When you move the locomotive and it's underway, that icon changes to a black triangle. When the engine is underway and you press that icon, you will get the emergency stop dialog. When the locomotive comes back to a stop, it will turn again to a black circle which again is shut down. You have manual RPM down, tower calm, smoke off, smoke on, engine reset, rule 17 lighting enabled, and rule 17 lighting off. By pressing the speed bar the icons on the touchpad change. We have our six preset railroad speeds, tower calm, smoke off, smoke on, the bar graph which is directly representative of the amount of labor the sounds will make pulling a load. To increase this bar graph simply press the FX button up. Across the top of our display screen it shows the icon of labor increase. As the bar graph is up further the locomotive will produce the sounds of laboring to pull the load. By pressing the effects down button, 
labor decrease appears at the top of our screen and our bar graph drops. The little one inside the circle is roll speed. That's the very first speed step that the locomotive will attain regardless of track conditions or load. To go back to the original menu on the touchpad, we simply press the AUX1 key and the original icons reappear. Now before we get our B&O GP9 running, there's two things that we need to do to this locomotive. The first is add smoke fluid to the smoke unit, and secondly we need to assign the locomotive ID number. To add smoke fluid, we simply remove the dynamic brake hatch as we showed earlier in the video. And remove the funnel. Using the 6-37841 Lionel Premium Smoke Fluid and the pipette, we need to add about three quarters of, a, of the pipette from the tip to the very first line in the smoke unit. A couple puffs of air are all that's required to make sure we don't have a meniscus in that stack. And this will allow the smoke fluid or the smoke exhaust to come up the stack easily. Again, doing it this way keeps the fluid out of, our, out of our funnel and ensures we get the most amount of smoke out of the stack. Reinstall the funnel in the smoke unit, making sure it's seated properly and that it's parallel with the sides of the shell. You can then replace the dynamic brake hatch in its position and it just snaps in place. I've already taken the liberty of moving the program run switch to the program position. So we're going to go ahead and apply power, and you'll notice that only the number board lights come on when power is applied. The cab light and the headlights are still off, and that's normal. So using our legacy remote, we're going to press engine 48. Since we've already loaded the engine memory module into the remote for engine 48, we need to tell the locomotive that it's going to be 48. So we press engine 48 on our remote, and then we press the set button. The horn confirms that it's taken the command. At this point, you want to turn the power off and take the locomotive off the track and place the program run switch back in the run position. We can now install the locomotive back on the track and go ahead and reapply power. Now once again, the only thing that comes on at initial power up are the number board lamps. Headlights and cab light and marker lamps stay off. Using the remote, I'm going to press engine 48 and press and hold the on off icon in the lower left hand corner of the touchpad, and I'll get this dialogue. This is the dispatcher, do you copy? Copy that, dispatcher. Over. Okay, start her up. Stand by for track orders. Copy that. Ready to start this trip. Out. Now, after the locomotive has started up, the sounds have begun playing, you'll notice the headlight comes on, as does the cab light. The red marker lights in the back of the locomotive are also illuminated. I'm going to go ahead and turn the smoke unit on. And it's not uncommon for it to take a few seconds before it starts generating smoke. Now this locomotive is unique in the fact that it blows smoke in three directions simply because of the rain covers over top of the stacks themselves. We we'll go ahead and play the horn for you. Those are the three levels of the quillable horn, the bell, crew talk, Tower column? Dispatcher here. You're clear outbound. Over. That's great. Thank you, sir. Now. We go ahead and turn the throttle and get the locomotive moving. You'll notice that the volume of smoke increases when you apply power to the motors. This is normal. The cab light also turns off when the locomotive is moving. Now, of course, the locomotive here is stationary, so the smoke is kind of engulfing the entire locomotive. It looks like it's on fire. 
you have to understand that when the train's moving down the track, that airflow will push that smoke back behind the locomotive. We'll go ahead and change direction so you can see the marker lights in the front. The rear headlight is now on. Change direction again. This locomotive is equipped with what's called sequence control. Sequence control is a series of uh, sound dialogues that are responsive directly to the throttle. So as you make changes to the throttle, the sounds make a resounding echo or play some type of sequence. Could be a horn blast, bell, uh, crew talk, or uh, tower comm dialogue, etc. It's all based off throttle response. And the whole idea is to put a little interaction, little interactive play value into the locomotive itself. So as this engine's running around the main line, it's making sounds, blowing the horn, ringing the bell, etc., while you're busy focused on another area of the layout or operating a different locomotive. So to enter sequence control, you simply press and hold the AUX1 key for three seconds. When you do this, the locomotive will give you two bells and a horn to tell you that you've entered sequence control mode. And it works like this. So two bells and a horn tells us we're in sequence control. So now when I go to speed step one, the train doesn't actually start moving, but it gears up all the sounds and the smoke and gets ready to move. And then speed step two, the bell turns on and it starts moving automatically. Dispatch, we have the green. Green outbound. Over. And all of these sounds are playing automatically. Now as I go to speed step two, the locomotive begins moving. Tower comm plays automatically, cab light goes off. That bell will stay on until I crest speed step 23. Once I get past speed step 23, the bell turns off automatically, and any sudden, re any sudden changes I make to the throttle will result in some type of sound from the locomotive. So a lot of interactive play value here and we encourage you to try this out with some of your other legacy equipped locomotives that have the sequence control feature. It's pretty fun. So as I slow the train down and get to speed step one and then ultimately zero, the bell will turn off and it will begin playing another dialogue sequence. Now to leave sequence control mode you press AUX1 or the straight arrow key and you press the engine reset button on the touchpad. The horn blast confirms that it's left sequence control. The other thing you can do with this diesel locomotive is you can add fuel to the fuel tank. And this is done by pressing and holding that reset key on the touchpad. When you release that reset key, you'll get this dialog. And finally, we'll go ahead and play the uh, shutdown sequence. This would be the black circle in the center of the touchpad. Now once we play the shutdown sequence, you'll notice that the locomotive is back to where we started, where only the number boards are illuminated. The headlight, the cab light, the smoke, and the sounds are all turned off. And they will remain off until you address the locomotive again and send it a command. Interesting tidbit about these new locomotives is they actually have two volume controls in them. There's a volume control for the prime mover sounds only, which does not affect the horn and bell. And then there's a volume control for the global sounds, which does affect horn, bell, and background sounds. So go ahead and start this locomotive up again and show you how to access both of those modes. Like I said, there's background sounds that we can lower the volume on. And that happens by pressing AUX1 or the straight arrow key, and then pressing the volume down icon. Well, we can lower the background sounds, but still have full volume on the horn and the bell. You can raise that background sound up again by pressing AUX1 or the straight arrow key, and holding the volume up icon. That brings your background sounds up. 
Now if you want to affect the global sounds, including horn and bell and background sounds, you simply blow the horn and press the volume down icon. Each time you press it, you'll hear a bell ding. Eventually to the point where the sounds are off completely. Now not even the horn or the bell will work. To raise that volume back up again, you blow the horn and you press the volume up icon. Each time you press the volume up icon, you'll get a bell sound to tell you that that volume has changed. And now we're back to full volume. And those are your new Legacy GP9s.